Hey everybody, so I'm reporting to you from Nigeria and we're still, we're still going to talk about thermodynamics in Nigeria because we have thermodynamics in Nigeria. We have thermodynamics all over the world and that's why we can use these laws to um, calculate things all over the world and we'll still get the same results, right? Now today we're going to be talking about closed systems and we deal with open systems in thermodynamics and we deal with closed systems and I'm just going to give you some tips and some tools to deal with when talking about closed systems. Um, so first off, we're going to start off by talking about energy. And we have like a, a general energy equation that we have here. And this small e, as we know, just means energy over mass, right? And this is denoted by our u plus v squared over 2. And I put that vector there for a reason. I'm coming back to that. Plus gz. Now, this u is simply the internal energy that we've learned about previously. This V is our velocity. And I put that V, um, that vector sign over the V because we, we have a lot of Vs in thermodynamics. We have our volume, our specific volume, our velocity, right? And this just helps like denote like what we're doing. So we're that just know that that's a, that's a V for the velocity. That G is our acceleration due to gravity. Um, and that Z is your height or your vertical displacement, whatever you want to call it. So um, there's some things to take into account when we're dealing with closed systems, right? Now let's say I have a system. Let's say this is my system, right? And energy can only be transferred in or out of a system through heat for a closed system, right? Or work. Mass uh, transferred through a closed system is zero and uh, sort of the way I like to think about it you can put work into a system right that can produce you can put you can put heat into a system through maybe conduction or something right if you have a container you can put heat into it but I can't physically put mass into it you can put work if I if I boil the system right and let's say I have a piston right if I boil that piston work is gonna be done Right? But I can't put mass into that piston. And you might be confused by the term piston. I'm going to go into that right now. Um, but just know that that mass transferred through a closed system is zero. Okay? Now, let's say I have... Um, let's say I have... Coming into a system and going out, I have a certain amount of heat. Right? Let's say I have 10 kilojoules of heat going into a system and I have um, eight kilojoules of heat going out of a system. Now, what is the change in heat in this system? The, let me say delta Q. The delta Q of this system is gonna end up being, we have 10 coming in and eight going out, so it's gonna, be, it's gonna end up being 10 minus eight, and that's gonna give us two kilojoules in the end. And this makes sense, right? We, um, we have, 10 coming in and 8 going out. So we end up with a positive, right? However, what if I were to say um, that, that 12 kilojoules left the system? So we have 12 kilojoules leaving the system, right? Now what's the change in this with the delta Q? We have 10 going in, but we have 12 leaving. So we end up with negative 2 kilojoules, right? And these, these signs are very important because they denote sort of the direction that things are going in. So it's very important to keep that, um, to take that into account. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Let me see. Um, okay, let's talk about path functions. Now, a path function intuitively is just a function that depends on the path, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, Path functions, just know that all properties are not path dependent, meaning that they don't require, the, the path we take isn't so important. However, Q, which is heat and work, are path dependent. So we're gonna get different results depending on the path that we take with um, work or heat, right? Now, something I want us to go over really quick. We're gonna talk about something called boundary work. And let's say I have a PV diagram, right? And let's say I have a process that ends up going from 
point one to point two, right? Now let's say this is my 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 process. Let's say it ends up going like this, right? Now I'm gonna end up having um, finding the work of the system. The work of the system can be found simply by finding the area under the curve. So this is the amount of work that was done by the system, right? And and this is just the area of a, like a parallelogram. And while there is a formula for the area of a parallelogram, I don't know it. And I don't know it offhand. But what I like to do, if you if you don't know the formula for the area of a parallelogram, I just like to divide it into a triangle and a rectangle or a square or whatever is left. And it's pretty simple to find the, the areas of those, right? We know how to do that. So um, just know that. The area, the boundary work done, and we call it boundary work because it's a closed system, is just the area under the curve, okay? Now, next, we're gonna talk about efficiency. Now, efficiency, we've heard of efficiency before. Efficiency is how efficient something is or how well it does, it gets its job done, right? Now, in thermodynamics, we denote efficiency with the Greek sign eta, not theta, that's eta, right? And efficiency is simply given by desired output over required input. And I can give like a, a process or, or like a, a device that does its job and I can say determine the efficiency of this and I can give that assignment to everybody in a room, right? And they all determine the efficiency and all of their efficiencies are different, but they're all correct. And why is that? It's because of this top part right here, desired output. Now, that desired output comes into account when we talk about things like, um, if I'm looking for a specific part of something, right? That's my, that's my desired output. Now, for, with refrigerators, for example, right? Some of you may know that refrigerators actually do produce heat. But that heat is not, we don't want that heat with a refrigerator. What do, we, what do we want a refrigerator to do? It's cool down like our food and our drinks, right? Now that cool temperature or that cool um, air, that cool temperature is what we're taking into account as our desired output, right? If we were to take that heat into account that the refrigerator produces, and by this heat that I'm talking about, um, goats is sort of like the back of your fridge. You, you'll probably feel like heat coming out of the bottom or wherever the, the exhaust or the output for that heat is you're gonna feel heat coming out of there and um, we're gonna go into more detail about that but that's because fridges sort of like fridges do produce heat but that desired output isn't taken into account by that heat unless we want to take that into account but we're not gonna use a refrigerator as a heater that desired output um, is just that cool air over the amount of work generally that we're putting into the fridge right and you should always find that your efficiency comes out to be less than one. And when we're converting that to a percentage, it's less than 100%. You can't have a, an efficiency over 100% or more than one because um, it's just not possible. We're not gonna produce more, uh, more of whatever we're looking for than we put in, right? Generally, no. So um, it's always good to take that into account. So that's efficiency. Um, now I wanna talk about piston cylinders. Now, piston cylinders are just devices that we have in like engines and cars. And these devices, we deal with work when we're talking about like piston cylinders, right? Now, this is a piston and this whole thing is like a cylinder. You can sort of imagine this in like 3D. So it sort of looks like something like this, right? So it's, it's literally a cylinder, right? But I just draw it like this just to give us an idea of what's going on. But literally, it looks something like this. So it's, it's circular, it's a cylinder, and then there's like a little piston that moves up and down. But um, when we're looking at it like in this like 2D sort of view, we just have to take in some things into account. Now, we might be dealing with like liquids inside of a piston cylinder or even uh, gases or, or whatever. But like these pistons can move, right? And it's important to note that like, let's say, let's say I had a liquid in here, right? And, and I had, um, I started heating that liquid and, and it started like turning into a gas, right? The piston is gonna eventually start moving up 
So let's say like my piston moves from point one to like this point, right? So this is my, my, my new point. It's important to note that in a free piston cylinder, free, right? Meaning that there's no obstruction, there's no, um, there's no, there's nothing like a, uh, prohibiting it from moving. Pressure is constant. And that's sort of because the way I look at it, um, basically, I think like, sort of, yeah, it's moving up, which would normally like decrease the pressure because there's more space for the molecules to move, right? However, um, those molecules like that are pushing on it, that have gained energy, make up for that. So there is more energy, not energy, but the speed of the molecules are moving quicker, yeah, and everything, which would normally amount to a higher pressure but it's not a rigid container. And when I use the word rigid, that means that like, um, it's not moving. Like, it's probably not a piston cylinder if it's a rigid container. It's just a container that is, the walls can't move or anything. So just keep that into account. In a free piston cylinder, the pressure is constant. Now, um, we might have piston cylinders that like, have these things called stops on them. And stops are really just um, things that prohibit the piston cylinder from moving, right? So if I have this, and I have um, this, so that's how I might just denote stops. So in this piston cylinder, for example, if the piston, if the piston starts moving, right, it's gonna be constant pressure up until it gets to this point, right? And once it gets to this point right here, and stops moving, the pressure is gonna start increasing, right? That's gonna end up being, wow, that's really a bad drawing. <laughs> um, the pressure is gonna start increasing, and that's simply because those molecules are still gaining kinetic energy, I guess, and there's nowhere for that piston to expand to, so there's nothing to make up for it, right? And that's sort of where boundary work comes into play. In a free piston cylinder, right, we have boundary work of, let me remove these stops just to denote the free piston cylinder, right? Meaning the pressure is always constant, right? Well, in any, in any closed system, our boundary work is given by the integral, well, well I'm, not, I'm not the best artist, but boundary work, which we denote by that, um, is given by the integral of P, D, now this is a capital W, so I'm gonna use the capital um, V, right? And this is simply from volume one to volume two, right? Now something sort of happens when we're dealing with a free piston cylinder, right? That pressure is constant. And when we have a um, constant with an integral, we know what we can do. We can pull up that constant, right? And this ends up being that constant P, which is our constant pressure, well, let me just write delta V. So that's simply V2 minus V1, right? P delta V. That's what we get with our, our free piston cylinder, right? And that's what denotes our boundary work. And this is simply just um, P V2 minus V1. Now, small boundary work, obviously is just gonna end up being the integral of P dV specific, right? And that's V1 to V2. So, I mean, it's just good to take these into account, and we're gonna uh, do example problems on what we get when we're dealing with a, um, a closed system. But these are just good things to know and to take into account. Let me just check if I forgot anything. I think this is the main gist of everything. And these are just good things to take into account when dealing with closed systems. And try and remember these, and these will help you a lot in your exams and your um, work. And let's enjoy thermodynamics, all right? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Ask questions in the comments if you need to, any clarification or anything. Tell your friends and let them know that uh, we're learning thermodynamics together, okay? Thank you.